Welcome to the Today Counts show. Today does count because it impacts, it influences your tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. The Today Counts podcast is sponsored by the generous donors of the Lead Today community. I'm your host, Kim Piper. Well, as I said on the introduction, during the introduction, I am very, very excited and honored to be speaking today with Johnny Serpilla. Johnny is the author of Life is Hard, But I'll Be Okay. It's it's a book that I got in my hands, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. It took me two days to read it. I couldn't put it down. Um, th- there was times where I was uh, really getting emotional about it, times that I was inspired, but I'm not going to uh, take all, all that time to explain that. I want to introduce Johnny. Johnny, say hello to our listeners. Jim, thank you for having me. Hello to everyone out there. That's great. Hey, I want to just jump in. Kind of what I'm going to try to accomplish, and like we said before I hit the record button, Johnny, is that is that this isn't going to get done on this podcast, but we're going to give it a shot. I want to talk about your book and all that is involved um, in your book, the, the story, all of that. I want to uh, learn a little bit about society brands, uh, your, your new business that you um, have going. And, and maybe it'll be woven in or maybe it won't, but I definitely want to make sure that we uh, start uh, touching on some of the leadership principles that you have learned and you're a very accomplished and successful uh, business person. And I know that uh, the majority of our listeners are leaders in the marketplace, they're leaders in ministry, and so they're going to be very interested to hear what you have to say about navigating the battles and the wars uh, of, of leadership. But I want to jump in right now, right away, and some of the things I'm going to I'm going to read a quote to you, and I'm just going to go ahead and and let you expound on that, expand on it for us. Um, one of the things that I highlighted in your book is this quote: "Faith is what gets you started. Hope is what keeps you going. Love is what brings you to the end." Now, before you respond to that, Johnny, our listeners probably have no clue the context. Why don't you go ahead and give us an overall uh, view of what your book is about? Absolutely, Jim. Um, you know, my book is is really meant to use our story and the tragedy in our life um, that I can touch on um, to really serve as the backdrop uh, for providing uh, to the reader uh, the power of hope and developing resilience and emerging through pain and learning to live with gratitude. And and that's really the story that I wanted to get out there and the message I wanted to get out there. And we're using our story of of building a family and the struggles that we had over many years um, and many losses in in order to have the three children that we have today. And so our story starts out uh, with my wife and I leading uh, very blessed faith-filled lives uh, born and raised in the faith and uh, very committed to it and literally living a life that we just thought it was too good to be true. Um, and, and one of the chapters even reflects that in the, in the title, you know, can this much happiness be real? <laughs> and it was real and, until it wasn't. And right. and we kind of felt that, you know, how are we so deserving of all this? And then our uh, family planning started and, and, and many tragic turns took place there um, just on a very high level. Uh, We gave birth to triplets, uh, our son, uh, Nicholas, daughter, Mary, and our son, Peter. And um, sadly, they all passed away 27 years ago, uh, shortly after they were born. And so from there, thinking that we hit a low, our journey just continued to find new lows and new ways that we were challenged in our faith. And so, you know, that's where faith, hope, and love really come to be. Um, You know, we knew we were going to be faithful to the Lord. We knew we were going to be faithful to each other, uh, but life was really hard. And as my book is called, uh, entitled Life is Hard, But I'll Be Okay, it was the acknowledgement that life doesn't have to just be uh, filled with blessings and happiness that we smile, but through tears and heartache, we can find blessings that are there that are really life-changing. And Nicholas, Mary, and Peter's brief lives changed ours for the better in so many beautiful ways that we lived with live today with an abundance of gratitude Hmm, yeah and 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 when when 
when you wrote about uh, you and your bride holding these three uh, precious souls in their in your hands in your arms while they passed that that was brutal uh, th- that was brutal I, I kept thinking about a principle that I talk about a lot at lead today is stepping in to the pain stepping into it versus running from it and you know the the purifying the cleansing the uh, other words I suppose we could add to that thesaurus but you you and your wife stepped into it. You held these babies as as they passed. Chapter seven in your book says, "Why not us?" That's the that's the title of chapter seven. Why not us? Talk about that a little bit. Where did that where where did that come from? And and teach us about that for a minute. So after Nicholas, Mary, and Peter passed, and the funeral and the times. Uh, that we'd see people after the funeral, there was a common theme that people would say to us, Jim, of, I'm sure you're wondering, why me? And we genuinely um, never thought, why me? Um, Susan didn't think it, I didn't think it. And it was really more logical to us to think, why not us? We've been blessed in so many ways. You see so many tragedies happening around the world on a daily basis. We should never be exempt from those. We should never um, really presume or hope that we are isolated from that, different from anyone else. We know that God doesn't cause those things to happen to us, but we know that God's hand is there as these things happen to us. And so for us, it just helped us to start our therapy journey and our continued faith journey from the step ahead if you will, of why me? We we just didn't live there and our minds just didn't go there. And so because we had that gift and it was probably because we were both raised in faith and we were raised by committed parents that explained to us uh, the responsibilities that we had and and where God is when bad things happen to good people um, and where he is in there uh, carrying us. Matter of fact, one of the chapters is Footprints in the Sand, which, you know, we all know that poem, and that was truly something that we lived when Nicholas, Mary, and Peter were alive, and as they passed, uh, we were carried through that. It was a joyful time. There was so much beauty in that. It was unbelievable, and we saw it at the time that we were living it. The tragedy part hit after when we maybe, if you will, kind of stepped away from godly thinking and more into worldly thinking that we saw the despair that we were in, but we are comfortable and always have been that it's part of our story. And this is the cross that we bear and, um, and do it really with a sense of honor. Um, and I say that only after a lot of prayer and helpful therapy for years to get us to that point, Mm -hmm. Uh, because anger was not something that we could live with. Well, the, the, the question why not me was one of the biggest takeaways for me personally um, because i have been guilty in my life in the in the past where i did an inventory of my life and i did some of that dumb stuff you know that face to face with god you know i've done this i've done that i've done this i've done all these things good why in the world you know would this happen to me and and it, it just uh, struck me um, as we grow older hopefully we we learn these things but if all of us listening to your story can really uh, embrace that well why not me why not me I, I wrote down three words it's a great perspective it's an incredible principle it's what an attitude frankly it's what all humans really need I think to to cope and leaders certainly in fact you add more meat to it On page 85, you write, uh, Kushner, if I'm pronouncing his name right, is helpful when he writes, and you quote it, we can't, I mean, this this was powerful. We can't pray that God make our lives free of problems. This won't happen. And it, and it is probably just as well. We can't ask him to make us and those we love immune to diseases because he can't do that. We, we can't ask him to weave a magic spell around us so that bad things will only happen to other people and never to us. 
people who pray, this is the this is the part that just, it was just the dagger. People who pray for miracles usually don't get miracles. Any more than children who pray for bicycles, good grades, or good boyfriends get them as a result of praying. But people who pray for courage, for strength to bear the unbearable, for the grace to remember what they have left, what they have left instead of what they have lost, very often find their prayer answered. I, I think that's another principle of lead today. The way we say it is don't simply take inventory of what you don't have, take inventory of what of what you, you do have. Um, how when you when you pinned that, what was that like? Did that just flow from your experiences? That was that something that was that you really had to like grit your teeth and write? Talk open up a little bit about that, Johnny. So first, you know, I um in in the weeks and months and years that followed their death, you know, I did a lot of reading, faith-filled reading, um, wanting to understand a perspective. Um, and it also tied with a therapy that my wife and I were doing. Uh, we were in therapy during our infertility years. And then when Nicholas, Mary and Peter passed, we already had a great relationship with who is now a business partner of mine, Dr. Barbara Fordyce. Uh, we do a lot of public speaking together and work with companies to help them reframe thoughts and in, ensure that their leadership culture um, is all that it needs to be to meet their missions for their company. But through cognitive behavioral therapy, we learn, Jim, the thoughts that come into our minds um, that can come into our minds through a variety of ways, whether it's through prayer, through it's uh, listening to others who say, again, I'm sure you're wondering why me, that literally you could take that and say, oh, I hadn't thought of that, but why me? And, and start going down that path. And so we started to learn how to reframe our thoughts and reframe our thoughts in a way that work for ourselves and nourish ourselves and help us as opposed to those thoughts that hurt us. And when we live in that moment of the why me, or we live in the thought that these bad things should be happening to others, first of all, it's not very Christian in our hearts uh, to, right. to think that way. And it's almost the implied version of when you say, why me? It's really the supposition that it should be someone else. Give it to somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And and I would never want to give to what happened to us to anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, but more than that, you know, I think it's the thought that what happened to us, my wife and I have said just about a month ago, we were talking about it again. Of course, we wish that Nicholas, Mary and Peter lived. Uh, we we wanted that more than anything. But to say that we would wish the experience away as if it never happened, we could never do that. Yeah. We could never do that to dishonor them, to make their lives so insignificant that we would be of the mindset that we wish we never went through that pain. Because with that pain, and it was intense, there was so much beauty, as I talked about. And again, we as humans, we always want more of a good thing. It's so natural, whether it's good food, um, it's good relationships, it's love, whatever it is, we want more of it. But at times we need to stop in gratitude and just say, I'm thankful for what I had. And so for us, that day was all that we had. So logically, and I know sometimes faith and logics um, you know, are not a natural intersection at times, but logically, and it, I think it is a gift that I was given from God to think of things with logic. If I had one day with our children as we had, why wouldn't I find beauty and gratitude in that? Mm -hmm. Why would I have to choose to keep my thought in my mind, them closing their eyes and taking their last breaths in the pain of losing them, as opposed to saying, God, you honored us to be their parents forever on earth for that day, for eternity together, that can be enough. And yes, we want more, but at some point we have to stop and say that will not be. And so therefore gratitude is really the place that we need to rest. And the more we started saying that to each other, the more we started reflecting 
on the miracle and the wonder of triplets and this experience and the kindness and love that was shown to us by family and friends, um, a doctor who delivering them was crying. I mean, there's so much beauty of God's love and mercy all around us. We have to be blind not to see it. And then we'd have to be, I don't know, I'm going to use the word arrogant, um, to block it out, to say that we're not going to allow that goodness in because we just feel that, you know, we didn't get the outcome that we wanted. So therefore nothing of this was good. No, there was so much that was good. And my wife and I, through God's grace, created uh, these three beautiful babies. And nobody through their own thoughts can take that away from us. And so we've we found our ways to honor them and, and really believe it. And Johnny, you do such an amazing job telling the story of everything that even led up to to that event, that that day where you lost your your three children. You, you talked about, you know, the different couples around you that you fellowship with that were having children. And maybe there was just an assumption that you guys were focused on your professions and and you, you kind of kept your struggles uh, to yourself. And then 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 all of this happens um, uh, just pretty, pretty powerful in the way that and and I want our I want to really encourage our listeners to purchase uh to purchase your book because I just think it's a it's something that needs to be in their library, something that they need to think about and even share, you know, with with other people. It is it is so encouraging. One of the questions that I had uh, for you, Johnny, as uh, and we're a long ways away from uh, uh, not talking about your book anymore, but all of the all of the the pain that you guys were going through leading up to that and then after that. Um, how how were you coping as a married couple? How were you how were you uh, hanging together? How was that? And then what was what was work like? How were you able to focus? What were the what were the things that you were struggling with um, during all of these these years? I mean, we're, we're not talking about a nine month uh, event. This for, for the listener, this was years of difficulty. You know, I, you know, honestly speaking, it, it, we were in survival mode. Um, you know, the, the joy uh, that we were feeling um, while Nicholas, Mary, and Peter were alive, and then even for the hours that we held them after their death, um, the bubble did burst when a nurse came in and asked which funeral parlor we were using. Mm. And, and so um, there was a sobering thought that came in and the reality that we were facing but Jim, from there, um, my wife and I um, were committed to, to grieve together. We received some great advice on the sobering statistics of divorce that happened to uh, couples that lose a child. And, and so for us, you know, we took that advice that we need to grieve towards each other, not grieve away from each other. We needed to recognize that our grieving patterns would be different. Um, our good days and bad days, days might not be in sync with each other, and that's okay. Um, a lot of patience uh, with each other. And, you know, we were really determined to feel all that we needed to feel. But at the same time, as I write about in the book, our three closest friends uh, were pregnant with us, uh, one having uh, their second child about 10 days after the funeral and uh, two others, um, you know, within the following month. And so what we knew that we had to do is be there for them and their joy, just as they were there for us in our sorrow. Hmm. And th that connection of emotion um, was not going to be broken because they were happy and we were sad. Hmm. We were going through life experiences together of being pregnant together, of growing our families together. We are in a faith group together. And with that comes the commitment of being there for each other. And I don't think that we are there for each other typically based on our own convenience. And of course, in fairness, we have to have our minds right and our heads be in a good place to really be there for someone truly. But at other times we just need to put our own thoughts and feelings aside and just be there for the people that need us. And I know it was not convenient for any of them, uh, especially with those three all being pregnant, to be there when our kids were born 
and and pass away and not internalize it to themselves and the the fear for their own children. That wasn't easy for them either. And so, you know, it it really became this classroom, God's classroom that we were in, Jim, that it was providing us life lesson after life lesson, that we had the opportunity to say, wow, this is this is an unusual position to be in. Yes, it is. And how are we going to face this? What's our strategy for this? And my wife and I would talk very openly and strategically that we need to be there visiting them with their babies often. We need to be there at the hospital for them as they were for us. It was gut-wrenching to walk back in that same hospital and that same labor and delivery floor that we were in two weeks prior when our kids passed away. Um, but again, it's not all about us. And so when I say that, if, if the listener is thinking, wow, how do you do that? I, we don't do it easily. Um, we don't do it without a, a lot of emotion and thought. Um, but there was a, lot, a commitment to others and putting others above us at times and at other times putting us above others where we wanted to take care of ourselves. And I think in doing that, because we kept living normally through their joy, it started to show us glimpses of that happiness that, again, we saw God's grace and how good he was to others and that um, you know, maybe someday that our day will come as well. I still don't know how you guys did that. I, I, I really don't. And uh, I, I admire you and thank you for being those kind of people. You know, I wrote down while you were explaining that, that so many would have excused themselves from that situation, from that celebration, uh, because of their own, their own sorrow. It, it it and, and I don't judge any of those, you know, for if that was their choice, but I just have not seen or heard this kind of a thing uh, very, very often. Um, now, Jim, let me comment on that, if I yeah. may. We we don't stand in judgment there either. Absolutely <laughs> not. What we thought through and talked through was that it didn't work for us hmm. to close off our love for them and our happiness for them because of our sorrow. And that just didn't work for us. That was not nourishment to us. Knowing that they were experiencing joy and we were physically removing ourselves from it, um, then likely feeling some level of guilt about that. Or if we were saying things like, I just can't be there, none of that felt good. And so then it comes about doing what is right. And oftentimes when we stand up and we do what is right, when we take that step, we're showing ourselves the confidence in ourselves that we can persevere through. Now, most times that we left their homes after holding their babies, most of those times we went straight to the cemetery. Yeah. Um, we would never, of course, let them know that. That was our way to reconnect to our kids, to have that physical proximity to them. But we found our ways to deal with it and um, find purpose for Nicholas, Mary, and Peter to be guardian angels over their beautiful babies and their families and, and to honor them. And so you got to keep looking for it. it. It's not always right there in front of you, um, but taking the opposite steps we knew was not the self-nourishment that we needed. Um, you know, I, I, I say that I worry about self-medicating, um, whether it's through drugs or alcohol or food or any other gluttonous kind of forms of trying to find happiness somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we got very conscious that we couldn't go down that path mm -hmm. and, and had to be careful on what's going to lift us up. And, you know, seeing God's beauty revealed through others, it, it really lifted us up. Well, I, and I certainly don't, you know, in reading your book and just getting to talk to you on the phone and even even now today, I I certainly have never had an idea that you guys are, are judgmental of others in any way. I still stand in amazement of you being there for your friends in a in a nightmare of a situation, you know, in, in your life. I. I wrote I wrote this down and I frankly kind of stole this from you, from you the other day 
the other day I, I was doing something hard. It doesn't really matter. It's not about me. This podcast is not about me, but I was doing something that, that was hard and someone looked at me and said, why are you doing this? And I said, well, because it's the right thing to do. It's, it's right to do, but I'll, I'll be frank. Uh, that extra measure of courage to do what I needed to do um, a few days ago came right from what you and I are talking about. Doing things because it's right. That is that 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 is powerful. If if people can 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 really work hard at identifying what is right versus what I'm feeling to do or what I think I might have the capacity to do, and and also as you admit it. You, you're not always able to to do, you know, can't be Superman every day, so to speak. And some days, you know, you need to uh, rest. You need to get your perspective. You need to heal. You need to that. But, uh, but we also tend, it, I think it's a surprising thing that, that when we keep the bar high in our lives, we have a tendency to get there. When we lower the bar in our lives, we have a tendency to go down, you know, to that. And 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 we know that every situation has its own context. We 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 get that in what we're talking about. But but nonetheless, I I just pictured these these couples at the hospital while you guys are going through that, and then picture you guys going and celebrating. What fascinating and beautiful fellowship. That is, I mean, that really is Christian fellowship where we could share with one another. Now, help me with the timeline. You you were running your family business for part of this timeline, but you were also the CEO of Camping World um, during during the story uh, somewhere. Uh, give us context uh, for that. Um well, first, I was I was the number two person at Camper World, so I was um, the president for a period of time, and then chief business development officer of the uh, parent company, Camping World, and, and Good Salmon. So, not the CEO, but um, when Nicholas, Mary, and Peter, when we were going through our fertility and uh, those times, and then through our adoption journeys and international and terribly intense pregnancies for my wife that followed um, and life threatening. Um, I was still running my own family business, um, Sir Pillar RV. And then through that, it um, all of this happened and it changed the leader that I realized that I needed to be. That did poise me in a position later um, about in 2003. So eight years from when Nicholas, Mary and Peter died. But um, in that time, then our other children were born. Uh, that Camping World approached me and I was one of the initial acquisitions to start up our roll-up strategy and go buy other dealerships across the country. And I was blessed to be on the executive team with some fascinating people and serve uh, there for 15 years uh, until past our IPO. And so for me, um, that time just showed me the type of leader that I needed to be and helped me frame in my mind that our employees, and whether it was back at Serpilla's when I had 80 employees or a Camping World when we had over 10,000 employees, that they all have their backstory and their home life too. And I really understood that if we're going to deliver genuine customer service and, and create vacation and memory times and recreation time for our customers, there's a circle of, of life from your work life to your home life, but all of it is really just life. Yes. And so if we're going to be unhappy at home, we take that into our workplace. And if we're going to be unhappy at work, we take that into our home place. And so I recognized there the real humanity of leadership and what it meant for me to lead at a different level um, because I was called from my own experiences to have a deeper understanding. Yeah. And, and I think it was I think it was your your family business where you created the forward focus uh, program is that right? And yes. You 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 know you were engaging yourself again. You were coming back in, and you you found things. You found the culture. Is it fair to say somewhat toxic? And and then you went into action. Talk to us about the forward focus because you you wrote about that in your book, and it was pretty significant. 
uh, because it, it was kind of like, you know, the question I was asking you on the phone, you know, Johnny, how are you dealing with all of this stuff? And, and folks have got to read the book to understand how many disappointments that you guys went through, how much effort you went through, how many difficult decisions that you had to do. These are all life shaping, uh, life could be life controlling situations. And yet you're running this organization. You find things are going sideways you create forward focus. Tell us about that and how the, and why that's so important in your story. Well, forward focus for me, as I developed it, became a survival technique hmm. because um, I, like many others who go through tough times when life is hard, we're operating on fumes. Um, we are right on the blades of, of falling apart. And so going into work and seeing what some may call a problem or a challenge, I couldn't get my head around. I mean, I, I almost laughed at it, um, thinking how insignificant that is and how through greater respect and teamwork and a united effort, that problem doesn't even exist. And the solution is so simple. So forward focus to me was where my strengths and my capabilities are, my talents, what I like about myself, what I like about my team around me, their strengths, their values, our solutions all live in forward focus. And the backward focus is my insecurities, me blaming others, the problems are in backward focus. Um, why others cause this and how that's gonna hurt us. And all that negative thinking was in our backward focus thinking. And, and what I did, Jim, is I told my team, who was all obviously aware of the life change that my wife and I just experienced, that in my company, we are going to create a new program of the way that we're going to interact with each other. And I'm going to give everyone 12 months, one year to get on board. And at the end of that year, everyone's employment is terminated and we're going to start over and rehire everybody. And people thought for a moment, uh, you know, Johnny's kind of on this, you know, life, life's tough for him right now. And, and so he's talking emotionally what they found that I wasn't. Um, I was determined uh, because I was not only trying to survive, but I was hoping to thrive. Mm. And I was hoping to move through survival into a thriving life and a thriving environment where I could play part in helping our team be lifted up at work for the 10 hours a day that they're there so that when they go home, they could lift others up when they get home. Um, as opposed to beating them down at work, allowing that culture to exist for the sake of the profit and the dollar that is out there that many companies work for, all the while knowing that we play a hand in that suppression of someone's confidence and abilities and talents and their self-respect. And then they go home where they might have authority or power and they misuse that authority and power at home. And, and there's abuse and, and other concerns or just disrespect and not a kind, loving environment. As, as leaders, that falls on us. It's our job as leaders to make our team successful. And I believe that the true leader wants that success for their employee at work and at home, because again, of that life cycle that I talked about. And so at the end of that year, I relieved two people, two very critical people from their posts that I think the team thought that I would never remove from the company uh, because of their knowledge and their value to the business. But the cancer that they served to be mm. in our culture wasn't acceptable. And then what happens as a result of this? I mean, our business nearly triples. There was more money falling to the bottom line than ever before. The more money that fell to the bottom line, the more opportunity I had to pay people more and pay them above market, gave me the opportunity to ensure that customer service challenges that oftentimes can be solved with money, were solved with money. All these good things happened. And, you know, oh, by the way, we're serving in the recreation and family fun industry. So I have people that could now genuinely offer that service because I always said, you know, none of my employees, including me, were actors and actresses. And so you couldn't put them in a bad environment and then think that when the customer shows up, they're going to just turn it on and their commission plan is going to take over and they're going to be genuinely good. Yeah. It's kind of like in, in you know, medical care today. If, if those nurses are beaten down um, 
through a variety of forces, whether it's disrespect by doctors, dis disrespect by supervisors, um, the hospital administration, whatever it is, and then that patient shows up that they need to give loving care to, how do, how do they turn that environment that they just walked out of off and walk into the hospital room and turn it on? I mean, that's just too hard to, to hope for. And so- Yeah, you- yeah, keep going, keep going. So if, if, if we really want those raving fans, if we really want to offer exceptional customer service, we need to create the culture for it where it's the natural outcome and outflow of what they're experiencing. And, and a leader that does not recognize that is a leader that I would tell you, number one, isn't close enough to the customer or to the patient experience, that they're not down there on the floor and seeing it in action. And they're somewhere in an ivory tower envisioning that their commands and directions with authority um, are, are what really drive change. Right, and, right. and I'm here to tell you that's, that's not the case in my experience. That, that is so good, Johnny. I, uh, and, you know, and, and one of the symptoms that you, you saw with these two individuals and others, at least at the beginning, was that, that we were losing some of the, the basic human things and the word you use was kindness. And I quote you here, on page 93, it says, as it turns out, now this is afterward, as it turns out, kindness transpires and turns out to be good business on many levels. And I just got a, I got a chuckle out of that. It's, it's funny how, you know, we have business intelligence, but uh, as my dad often said, is the larger an organization gets, the dumber it can get. And we kind of forget some of those basic things of just kindness. And uh, I remember seeing that and just highlighting it. Why, 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 why? And my mistake about getting your title wrong, but for those that are listening, a president is a CEO in the sense that they manage the P&L of the company. A P&L stands for profit and loss. It is, it is the guy in charge. It just means that he reports to a CEO who might have uh, other businesses underneath him that has to be managed. So what an incredible responsibility um, that that you had and I know that more and more uh, people will be interested uh, in this now you left camping world um, right at your 50th birthday right at the time where camping world went public uh, the things you shared with me over the phone were pretty rich I'd like to encourage you to say why I mean 50 you, you mean, I mean you're on top of the world you're you're, you're IPO uh, you're going public, uh, you know, why, why at, why at 50, you're, you're in good health. Um, uh, you're a young man. Some would say that your fifties are your best times. So why, why would you check out then? You know, Jim, I, I think there's a season in our lives, um, for all things. And I'm a believer in those seasons and, uh, God really just had it on my heart. Um, the day of our IPO on the New York Stock Exchange floor, it was, it was a time that we worked for for 15 years. Um, it was, you know, something that was, you know, what a lot of business dreams are made of. I had it on my heart heavy that day that it was time to go and, and left for the airport about six hours before my flight, thinking it was anxiety about my son's high school football game. Uh, that night as a high school quarterback, I needed to be there to see my boy. And as I was sitting at the airport, I just kept hearing it and it, it hit me that it was time to go. And in this second half of life, whether it was my 50th birthday and some midlife crisis, whatever you, you want to call it to me, it was divinely inspired where, yes. you know, God just had it on my heart that it's time to go pursue other things. And in my second half of life, um, and, and, and looking at it kind of in a sporting analogy at, at halftime, you know, what is it that I want to do? And not, not that I'll live to be 100, but what do I want to do in significance in my 50s and 60s um, and that are truly purposeful? And I will tell you that what I was doing professionally was truly purposeful. Um, I was certainly affirmed that by the generous compensation plans and the stock and all those things that went with it. But at some point, we can all ask ourselves, what is enough? Mm -hmm. and, and I know for every uh, man and woman out there that that answer can be a different answer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I respect that. Uh, for me, I knew that it was 
time to explore and to do other things. My dad chose my first career for me. And I spent 30 years in that industry and loved it. He even chose my uh, college major as a county. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I just felt that it was time to explore and and just kind of go into prayer and, and ask God where I'm meant to be. And uh, my daily prayer for a long time has been for God to put the people in my path that I'm meant to be with. And I'm never let down with that. And I, and I get to meet wonderful people like you that um, are making a difference out there and helping leaders. And and that's really what I'm passionate about. Johnny, I want to I want to dive into this a little bit more. So, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in, in corporate America or really in any, even in ministry is that uh, uh, people tend to stay longer than they should. They don't seem to recognize it until it's too late. And and um, the the exit isn't as good as it it could be or maybe or maybe should be um why do why do you think that happens why do you why do you uh i mean i i don't think now correct me if i'm wrong because your story seems a little more pointed than some of my experiences but we seem to get hints we seem to get hints because I really do. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying this because you're my guest on the podcast. I'm saying this because I believe this. I too believe that seasons are a really critical part of managing our lives and our purpose in life. Uh, I, 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 I don't think it's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone can't start with a company and retire with that same company. I don't think that's what we're saying. But what we are saying is that there does seem to be seasons Yet some people get caught by surprise that their season is over and they didn't really get to participate in the deciding of that. From your perspective, you've got a lot of experience. Why does that happen to so many of us? I think that uh, my first thought that comes to that, Jim, is, is the idea of fear. You know, fear of stepping out into something else that your heart wants to lead towards, but we get so comfortable, whether it's with income or status. Um, you, you know, I, I was really, really blessed to be so high at the top of such a large company, you know, billions of dollars of revenue, uh, over 10,000 employees, uh, people knew who I was. There's, there's a lot of, you know, very valuable um, and uplifting sides of all of that. And whether it's that or you are, leading a team of 100 people or 10 people, that you feel a comfort there. I, for myself, um, it's maybe a little bit of my control freak nature. Um, I am a man with anxiety. Um, I, I know and I've, I've studied a lot of the word in scripture on anxiety because that word is, is mentioned so many times mm -hmm. in the Bible. But I think my anxiety really serves me well, Jim, because I worry about a lot of things. And I worry about staying too long. I worry about missing the, the signs and signals that God's giving me that others through their actions are telling me that maybe there's something else out there. And so the control freak in me wants to be very intentional about my actions and my decisions so I craft my future. And when I was sensing that there was more that I wanted to do and explore, when there was truly nothing wrong with my career, I loved my career. It was so good to me. I had, you know, really reached great heights. But when something's gnawing at you that there's more, and it turned out writing this book was a big part of it because there's so much to the story that went beyond Nicholas, Mary, and Peter and you know, so many things that happened in this book that I felt that there was another purpose I was being called to. I've never written a book before. Um, I'm, I'm not a writer. I'm not, I'm really not even an avid reader. Um, you know, the, the books I have read are self, self-help books. Mm -hmm. I love John Maxwell and, the, and his teachings and preachings. And so I can throw myself into that stuff. But, you know, it, it's, it's following those desires that um, are hitting us and and not being fearful of it and and so I just felt that it was time. Yeah, I, I think that's good. You think it's also I, I don't know about you, but when I think about 
really anything in life. If, if I have come to a place of comfort, uh, the possibilities of me becoming sloppy uh, seem to increase. Uh, uh, maybe not having the gratitude. Um, it, it seems like, you know, God made us uh, innately uh, with ambition, with desire, uh, with creating, uh, with exploring, you know, whatever that, how that word resonates. So once we get to a, a summit, I mean, I, I think the Western mindset sometimes struggle with that. The goal isn't to get to a place of comfort, but I think that's the mindset that has captured the uh, Western, you know, Western thought. Uh, it's great to achieve, but maybe that's a step. And uh, and the way that I, I think we temper that is with the question you posed earlier, which is how much is enough? It's really not about stuff, um, but it is, are we continuing to grow? Are we continuing to learn? Are we continuing to give? Are we continuing to experience? You know, those those are some of the things in life that God has has provided for us if we will will do that. That's, that's, that's awesome. Um, speaking of, you know, your seasons, uh, let's, let's take a little bit of a, a detour and talk about, and we'll come back to your book here in just a second, but let's, let's talk about society brands. Is that the, is that the name of your new business? I know that your URL is encouraged 33.com. What, what is the, what is the name of your business? And tell us a little bit about that. So Society Brands, I'm so excited about this project, um, serve on the board and, and one of the co-founders. Um, as you know, in, in my uh, past experience, I was a, a leader in aggregating the RV dealership and buying dealerships and bringing them all up under uh, one larger company. And so taking that experience, um, my nephew, Michael Serpilla, had an idea uh, around doing the same thing in the Amazon space with Amazon brands that are selling uh, online. And so he approached me on the idea. I immediately got excited about it. Uh, my son, Bo, joined in on that conversation and the three of us kind of germinated on it for a while and talked about it and, and what that could be. And then we started just bringing in other just incredibly great people um, that you know are really meaningful to us. And uh, some, uh, some friends that I was um, acquainted with um, another board member on a med tech board uh, that I worked with in, in uh, a great operator named uh, Sean Doherty. Um, then we brought in my uh, nephew, Justin, to be our president um, after he had spent time aggregating in another industry in the professional employment space industry and really brought great people together to form this organization called Society Brands. And we're literally a society bringing people together where we're helping entrepreneurs grow their business. And so uh, we go out and buy these various brands, bring that, have that owner stay with the company, bring them on board and provide them all kind of amazing support uh, through our teams. And uh, it's it's been a great run and it's been great working with family. Again, it's been great working on the national scale uh, with the lenders that have worked so generously with us, the board, um, the investors, it's really been uh, a great run and, and we're really excited about this new company. Uh, how is it different than an equity group, Johnny? So for us, I mean, for me, I have a small family office, which is what Encourage is, mm -hmm. okay? And so I take my own self-funded dollars and go out and invest in businesses that I believe can drive change and, and make a difference. Um, one that I'd, I'd love to uh, talk about is uh, a close friend of mine and partner, Larry Dust, that owns Key Benefit Administrators, the largest independently owned third-party administrator in the country, um, has about 3 million people under healthcare management, six patents that drive um, driving down the cost of healthcare while getting employees healthier. So I uh, would certainly love the opportunity for anyone to reach out to me um, through my website and, and I can make that introduction. They're phenomenal. Um, but I love getting involved in companies like that and, and helping and making a difference. What Society Brands is, um, is you know, a separate company that I, of course I'm an investor in, I'm a board member, I'm a stockholder in, 
Um, but it is now for me a really blessed time to serve in bo as a board seat as I'm on some public boards, private boards, um, and in this case, another private company to serve on the board and help to lead an organization um, through the great um, efforts of our employee group. Uh, we bought a really strong Amazon marketing firm was our first acquisition. Now we've bought a host of other brands and it's just an honor to be out of the daily operations and to lead uh, really from a board level and strategic level. That, that's very interesting. Now, do you do you buy these companies uh, wholly? Do you do you become a partner? Um, <clears throat> how does how does that work? Or is it not necessarily a cookie cutter um, approach? It's not cookie cutter, but our ideal plan is that we buy a portion of the company, okay. um, a large majority and portion of the company, and then they become. Uh, owners as well and in our new company, right, in the society. And they join the society with us um, as equity holders. And so that for the second bite of the apple for the that entrepreneur, it gives them a chance for more reward at the end as opposed to just selling their company and being done. And so I think that's the thing that really makes us unique and special in the marketplace. And uh, the markets responded very, very well. That seems very creative. Uh, so I, if I'm understanding it right, there's some core uh, services that are made available to uh, each of these as they as they come into the society. Am I getting the perspective right? That's right. Whether it's marketing, it's new product development, it's capital um, for growth, for more inventory, uh, for more employees. Uh, more product design and development. So we bring all of that to the table and really want to honor, uh, you know, when I think back to it, it was the young Johnny Serpilla at 36 years old when I yeah. sold the Camping World. Um, I, I was in that seat. I know what these entrepreneurs are thinking and feeling. And, um, you know, we're, we want to give them the opportunity to sell a significant portion, but still have skin in the game and do great things together with us as a team. And, um, and really build a family. So we certainly have family members as part of it, but then our partners have, you know, really formed, like I said, a great society where we respect and care about each other and we really want to operate at that highest level. That That is um, very interesting. Again, for the listener, and we'll have this on the notes, but it's encourage33.com. I would encourage anybody who would like just to learn to go to the website. I think your website does a pretty good job of explaining um, all that you've uh, got going on, as, as you call it, your family office. That's that's really good. Let, let's let's come back to the story. And uh, being parents, and as you said, being a dad is is really you know what you want it to be. You make that really clear in, in the book. It's just what you want to be. And Johnny, you and I share that. I have uh, two children of my own. They're both married, and those two children I consider my own. And they have uh, gifted Rhonda and I with seven grandchildren. Um, uh, they're a very important part of my purpose uh, in, in life. Being a father, being a grandfather uh, is just a tremendous honor. And in, with it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, that's involved in, in being connected with other human beings on this planet. And so I know that we share that heart You've made that very clear um, in your book. But the story didn't end with the passing of Nicholas, Mary, and Peter. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't end there. Um, <laughs> a miracle happened. Um, pick up the story from there. What, what, what happened after that? So after that, we continue to stay focused to become parents. Um, and, you know, through another uh, loss after them in pregnancy uh, of twins, um, I pushed for international adoption. And so we went around the world uh, to Paraguay and there's a whole story in the book uh, regarding that experience. Um, and then we really thought adoption was our path and our hope um, and our hearts were open to whatever child God wanted us to raise to please send to us from whoever, wherever, any color. Uh, we just, we wanted to be parents and, and we knew that, um, you know, that's what we were called to do. Uh, through a host of 
very difficult events and life-threatening surgeries for my wife that happened as a result of the twin pregnancy uh, following the triplets. Um, we ended up becoming uh, parents uh, to our son, Bo. And uh, Bo is an American baby that uh, we adopted uh, at birth and our lives changed. Um, I never really saw myself adopting. I never really thought about that. A lot of us don't grow up saying, you know, I can't wait to you know, grow up, get married and adopt a baby. Um, in our case, when that opportunity presented itself, it just seemed so obvious and clear that as desperate as we were to love, um, there was a baby out there that was that desperate for us. And so that's why one of my companies is Encourage Adoption, where I use any opportunity like this to speak of the yes. beauty of, and the gift of adoption. Yes. I think in the whole abortion debate today, and it's so prevalent in our country right yes. now, the topic of adoption is just not talked about enough by either side. Mm. Um, I uh, clearly am pro-life, but uh, for me, um, even in that pro-life movement, the opportunity to discuss adoption needs to happen more and more. Of course, that needs to happen after the decision has been made not to abort. But for me, um, I believe in what we've witnessed in our lives through countless adoptions that we've been involved with and helping others, and certainly in our own story, um, you know, when I think of the sacrifice that that birth mother made uh, to give Bo the life that she and her family couldn't um, is one that she doesn't have regret about because she, um, we promised her that Bo would have an amazing life. Bo has had an amazing life. Um, he's had his challenges just like anyone else, um, but he has, um, we won the lottery when we got to be Bo Serpilla's parents. Oh, that's a great and way to say it, yeah. We really did. And then uh, following that, we had uh, two very complicated uh, pregnancies that uh, were accidental uh, that did uh, produce uh, two biological children. I only say that for the point of clarifying to, to us and our family, we really don't see much of a difference in biology. Um, and I've, I've often said that one of my kids is adopted. I just don't remember which one. Um, <laughs> and so Bella and Stone followed and you know, they grew up knowing um, that uh, Bella came not even two years after Bo was born and Stone about 19 months after Bella was born. And so before we knew it, we had, um, you know, three kids um, just under the age of four and life was amazing. And uh, it's been that way ever since, in spite of life continuing to be hard through medical challenges with the kids and my wife, um, you know, but we're all okay. You know, uh, it's such a fun story. You know, you, 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 uh, any reader cries with you as you're going through uh, the story in your book. And then all of a sudden, this other, these other things start happening. And there's chuckles, you know, that happen when you're, when you're reading the book. And one of my favorite parts is, and, I, and, I, and I'm supposing, of course, this is Bo. And lo looking at Isabella, if I got this, got this right, looking at Isabella and saying, is her real? <laughs> is, is her real? And then you answering, yes, bud, her is real. Um, that, that, is, that is such a, a wonderful uh, piece of that. And, and for those who, who decide to dive in and learn a little bit about you and your work in this book, they'll also be able to see pictures of of the now and just to see, you know, how your family has grown and flourished and uh, what, what a, what a beautiful thing. Um, in chapter 16, and I'm not going to do your whole book because, you know, uh, people need to buy it and read it uh, to get <laughs> all of it. <laughs> but uh, I, I just, you know, uh, I, I kind of find us as kindred spirits because how many times have I cried in joy of being a dad, being a grandpa? And it catches me off guard at the, the times I just, you know, I mean, I'll give you an example. I was at a swim meet uh, watching my eldest grandson, and he was in the finals at, at, at this elevated competitive uh situation and I had never been you know I'm not a swimmer I could barely save myself so I mean it's funny when I tell people I surfed as a teenager and I did but 
I just surfed and then I made it to my surfboard. You know, I didn't, I didn't have to, but anyway, uh, he was introduced, you know, as he's, as he's on the blocks and, and I just, for some reason, just broke down and, and started crying in the stands. You know, of course I tried to hide it from everybody, everybody else. And I asked myself later, why, why did that catch me off guard? You know, so bad. I, I guess because I know the work that he'd been putting in and, and the desire that he had. And of course, you're just for them. You know, you're, you're, you're a cheerleader. But you say on page 170, I'm a dad. All I ever wanted to be. And this honor was mine. Uh, that, uh, yep, yeah, I'm right there with you. It's it's a an amazing, uh, amazing, amazing story, and uh, there's just so many other things you know that you share. And you know what? Where do you get your energy, Johnny? Now, just for fun, at the top of your head, before I go back, because I'm going to talk about leadership for the remainder of this podcast. But where in the world do you get your energy? What board are you not on? I mean. Uh, <laughs> off the top of your head tell us be, be, be beside your your business society brands and encourage 33 just really quickly run run through what you're involved with oh goodness um so <laughs> I, I i served for um well over a decade uh, nearly 15 years um at the united way um and i chaired the allocations council giving the money out uh, I chaired the campaign, raising the money, and then I ultimately chaired the board. Um, and so loved that opportunity to help so many great community organizations. Um, I uh, was a youth leader, a youth minister uh, for a number of years, loved doing that, loved serving there. Um, I'm on the board of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame Health Board as well. I'm on that board, um, serve as um, a board member to uh, Lippert, Components, a publicly traded company, um, on the board of um, a great med tech company um, called Tectrom. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting a number of other organizations. <laughs> yeah, I, think, that, I think you are, but yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's but, um, you know, I, I have to say, Jim, I, I want to comment that, first of all, I appreciate your your good heart and, and the emotion that you felt when you read those words. And, and you know, I, I have to say that I think that's the emotion that I would love every man to feel hmm. when they read those words, um, that I'm a dad and that's all I wanted to be. Because if you're not feeling that, um, maybe you're not really being a dad. Maybe you're not really feeling all of that. I think that there's a difference between fathering a child and really being a dad. Oh, wow. And yeah. And I want to put that challenge out there to people. And I say this so respectfully. I say it with no judgment because, you know, I know from my own dad as his parents, Italian immigrants coming here, um, my dad had great respect for his father, but his dad was not emotionally available to him. He was so worried about putting food on the table and surviving um, in, in a new country um, and that he really found, my dad would say, you know, more peace and happiness in his gardens and with the goats and chickens than he did with his six kids. Um, and my dad had respect for him, but he didn't have that close connection to him. My dad wanted to do more, uh, yet my dad was building a business from the ground up and, and worked a lot. But I never, ever questioned my dad's devotion to our family, his devotion to my mom, um, how clearly... Uh, family was important to him. And he was a tough guy. He was one that had high expectations and you were going to work hard. And I did work hard for him and he wasn't going to handle disappointment well, but he was fully committed. And so I, I know that I'm highly emotional. I'm, I'm somebody that wants to talk through everything. I want to feel every great thing. I want to feel every sad thing as well. And I want my boys and my daughter, I want to talk about it. I want to talk about it with my wife and all of those things. But we all can do it on our own way. But if, if you really don't think that, geez, I'm so blessed to be a dad, this is incredible. Um, you're missing out and, you, and your child's missing out on something there. And, and we all have pressures and life is difficult and challenging. And that's exactly what my book is all about. Yes, it but is. there's a top of mind 
thought that that we as men and fathers need to have about the priority of of the honor that was bestowed upon us to be a dad. And, you know, Mother Teresa said it well when she said, you know, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Mm -hmm. And when you just think about that, if everyone goes home and loves their family and pours love into them, does right and loves others, those two core things, if we do that, you know, how this world changes. And I know we want to change the world by pointing the finger at all the flaws and everyone else out there. But oftentimes the people that are doing that aren't looking inside their own home and the the infractions that are happening there. And I can tell you, I don't have a perfect household. You know, we thank God many times for sending us imperfect kids because as imperfect parents, we Mm -hmm. thought we perfectly went together, uh, the five (laughs) of us. And, and so, you know, there's so many times that I've had to apologize to my kids that whether I lost my temper or I was too hard on them because my expectations were too high, but I, I know that they never questioned how much I love them Mm -hmm. and, and, and how I would lay down my life for them. And so, you know, I, I put that out there because in a time where there's so many challenges in our world, going home and loving your family, I think Mother Teresa really had it right there. That's going to change the world. My wife and I say um, on every stage that we're allowed on, and when we speak of the topic of parenting, we say the best thing that you can do for your kids is to build a great marriage. And, uh, And that kind of goes back to what Mother Teresa is saying. It's really the center. It's, it's the glue of society. Um, you know, business plays a huge part in it. Ministry does, school systems do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it really, it, it really is so important that we get back to the basics. And, and truly, uh, my, my two cents in what you just said is that if we can lead and love at home, we have more power everywhere else we go. If we if if we're weak there, boy, we're not going to do well anywhere else. We're not going to do well anywhere else. In some ways, it's the most difficult place to lead because we're so familiar with one another. It's the slightest word or lack of word or little, you know, uh, trigger, all the different little triggers that we have and the closeness of relationships. But that's where the battle is fought. If we can love and persevere and be persistent through those things, be intentional. Uh, uh, what, you know, our ministry helps families build uh, uh, marriage playbooks and family playbooks. We spend all this time building business playbooks. And, uh, and of course, Lead Today does that as well. But um, I, I, I can't agree. I, I, can't, I could go on for a half an hour uninterrupted, you know, just agreeing with you 100%. I want to encourage everybody that if you're discouraged, if you're discouraged at home, go back home. Just keep fighting it, fighting it out. The grass is not greener on the other side. It's a, it's an old cliche, but if, if your grass is dead, start watering it, and you'll be surprised what will happen. You know, I remember when I was younger, and I would be um, uh, discontent with the car that I had. And it's amazing what would happen when I would vacuum the car out, and when I would wash the car, when I would put effort on taking the care, care of the car, I would back up and say, you know, that's not such a bad car. And I would really kind of like that car. I own that car. That's, that's my car. And, and I think that it's certainly true in relationships, um, really spending time listening to one another and relating to one another. Johnny, you've already agreed to do another podcast with me, all on the topic of leadership. But before we leave, maybe I can steal another 10 or 15 minutes from you on this podcast that we can almost use as a preview of more to come. And maybe we can do kind of an overall perspective. You have learned a lot about life and leadership. You've learned it from what you've gone through as a a husband, what you've gone through um, as a father, certainly as a business owner and as a business leader, and now starting all over again, uh, sitting on the board. You've sat in so many different chairs, first chair, second chair, um, entrepreneurial, a corporate leader. You, you do have maybe even more 
inventory than you might realize. Um, I have relationships with presidents and CEOs all around this country. And uh, your resume is right there at the top. So I know you've got some things to say. I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but maybe we just have a little conversation. Let me couch it this way. If you were to talk about three, five, seven uh, principles that that uh, you know that you would bring to any context, you might have to make it contextual where you go. But what what are the what are the what are the topics that's on your mind that you would say, yeah, this is part. This is part of what every leader needs to bend their ear to and at least consider. You know, first one that comes to mind to me, Jim, is what John Maxwell teaches in his leadership principles, that the toughest person to lead is yourself, Hmm. that we judge others by their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions. Hmm. And and as Mr. Maxwell introduces that that theory, I've thought about that so much. And, and thought about as a leader, um, when I'm hard on someone else and soft on myself, um, hard on them for their actions, but then soft on myself for my lack of action because I had good intention. And so, you know, I love starting there um, because you really can't lead anybody else until you lead your own life. And we see many leaders today that their own lives are in peril and in challenge. And it doesn't mean that they cannot bring financial profit to to the bottom line. Absolutely not. Um, But it does mean that maybe that they're not in the best position to create what really we want today, which we want it all, right? We want a inclusive company that is kind and welcoming to everyone. We want fairness. We want equality. We want equal pay for men and women. We want um, racial tensions to be gone. We want all these wonderful things that should happen. Um, And somebody might not have the presence of mind because, again, they're judging others on their actions and themselves on their intentions. So they want those good things. Those good things aren't happening in their company, but they allow that to be that way because that they have the intention for that. Right. And so leaders need to surround themselves with others that can fill those gaps. So if you're that leader that does an amazing job putting dollars to the bottom line in the top line, God bless you. We need those leaders out there. But we also need the leaders out there that recognize where their deficiencies are Hmm. and they can bring in strength around them and really good people, not micromanage them and let them go out there and soar and make a difference in that company. Hmm. Put your ego aside and recognize that, you know, that boat rises together and everyone moves up. And so that second principle that I've I've mentioned earlier, and I really felt that it was my core responsibility when I was at Camping World was to make those on my teams, make them successful. Every day when I come to work, I was already in the number two spot in the company. The number one spot was not going to be available to me. And I didn't want that. We had the leader in that spot. I was honored to serve at number two. And it was my job to ensure that others were successful in their career. I took that incredibly seriously to the point where I still struggle a little bit today, Jim, with the fact that the most selfish thing I've ever done in my life is to retire Hmm. um, and to say, I'm going to put my desires and my family needs first for this new season of life Hmm. because I left behind people that I loved and cared about and respected that served that company so well. And doesn't mean that there weren't other capable leaders there to step in and for them themselves as leaders to continue to do the great work. But we had something special together and I really valued and I enjoyed that. And so if a leader doesn't accept that it's their job to make the others successful, they're missing out. If that leader is thinking about their career and their growth and their income and all of those things and their ego being served and all those things that are the focus on them, they're missing a great opportunity to lead. So I'd love to talk uh, more about that. And then I'd love to talk about, you know, the idea of, um, you know, those of us that walk a faith filled life and any denomination 
any faith that that is. I'm somebody that, of course, I love my Catholic faith. I love my Christian faith. Um, but I have high, very high respect for other faiths. And um, I get troubled when I know men and women of faith that somehow find it their way to leave that at the door and not bring it into the workplace. Mm. Um, and, and a lot of faith talk is being pushed out of the workplace. I understand that, but it doesn't mean that our faith-based principles, we don't take in and then act as servants and servant leaders as we're truly called to lead. And so, you know, the, the person that we are sitting in the pew on Sunday or in Bible studies on Wednesday nights or whatever that might be, it's that same heart and mind that we are as the president, as the supervisor, as the general manager, whatever our title is, that we got to carry into work. And, and as simple as doing right and loving and caring about others, those two simple principles can really drive your organization to new heights. And that's, that's so good, Johnny. I mean, when, when someone says, so how was your weekend? And they're, and they're looking for a little inventory instead of leaving out going to worship you include that as simple as that we went to a ball game we went to church we had a great barbecue it was you know um but so often be, because of the paranoid hr policies and i speak often about this so um, I'm not putting this on you, but <laughs> uh, we, we tend to say, I went to a baseball game, we had a family get together and a great barbecue and we, we, we skip, you know, the, the other part. I just, then people say, oh, he's a normal person, you know, and that kind of opens the door, but I didn't mean to interrupt, just wanted to interject that. That's really good. No, I agree. And it's the way that we connect with our employees, right? Yeah, our right. teams, the way that, you know, we show them that, you know, our frailties um, are real and that we have them. I have insecurities as a leader. I, I don't need to hide that. Um, that's not going to put my job um, to be threatened because I'm honest about some things that I need strength and help in these various areas. And, you know, I'm a big believer that insecurity is the root cause of all workplace conflict, Jim. Mm -hmm. I think we could spend a lot of time talking about that and, and how Let's do uh, that. Yeah. leaders allow their own insecurities to serve as a cancer in their organization to harm their employees um, by not just acknowledging um, what they're insecure about or not acknowledging that when they have an action that is ugly, that they don't stop and reflect and say, where in the world did that come from? Why did I say that? Why do I feel that? What's the root cause of that? And likely in the territory battle that we have in corporate America, where you want your universe to get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, you feel threatened when somebody's criticizing your workspace because maybe you have an insecure feeling that you'll lose that division or that someone's calling you out that you're not doing well enough um, or that you're missing something. And why isn't it that we can't say, wait a minute, that's interesting. You're, you're saying something about my team that I haven't seen. Help me understand that more. Seek to understand where that thought is coming from, that somebody from the outside can see that you're not seeing. And then as opposed to offering defense, which is so natural for us to get defensive, but to literally put your insecurities away, some of those issues could be because of your poor leadership. And that's okay. We're imperfect. Own that. Acknowledge that. And I've just seen people struggle with that so much. Um, I've struggled with it myself at times, and I'm disgusted with myself when I do. Beautiful. Johnny, this has been a tremendous time together. Um, we're going to calendar our next one and it's going to be so much fun i think we're going to have a lot of fun sparks flying and and some some good amens going about leadership that that'll be great i really appreciate, there you go yeah i really appreciate the time that you've invested uh into uh, our listeners well i'm happy to be here jim i'm excited to come back 
And thank you for including me in, in the great messages that you're putting out there. And I'm hoping that my words and, and certainly my book can be of, of some help to people at some point in their lives. Um, and as I write in the dedication, outside of the fact to my wife and really honor her for the warrior that she is, you know, this book is really written for anyone that finds life to be hard and for those who provide strength and wisdom for the journey. And you're one of those people providing strength and wisdom. So I thank you. Oh, I really appreciate it. And again, we just want to remind everybody that it's at encourage33.com if they want to learn more about any of the topics that we've talked about today. Is that right? That's right. Or you can follow me on Instagram at Johnny Serpilla, certainly on LinkedIn, Facebook, um, all that so you can see, see what I'm doing. Well, we have more to come. Thank you so much, Jim. If you're not part of the Lead Today community, let me invite you. Go to leadtodaycommunity.com. That's leadtodaycommunity.com and sign up for Monday Moments. It's a weekly email that will encourage your leadership. Again, thank you for joining us today and thank you for telling a friend about the Today Counts show.